This video is about linear dynamical systems. We'll look at the meaning and develop an example in detail. Other names for linear dynamical systems are difference equations, linear recurrence relations, and discrete dynamical systems. In part one, we'll look at definitions and examples of linear dynamical systems. Phenomena in science, engineering, ecology, economics, etc. are often described by a sequence of vectors in Rn. We'll write this sequence x0, x1, all the way down to xm and beyond. So for example, daily stock prices on the S&P 500, here n is equal to 500. The state of a computer on each successive machine cycle, here n would be several billion or maybe even trillions. Population vectors in ecology, We'll look at a related example in detail below. The concentration of various chemicals in the bloodstream of a patient, for example, oxygen, CO2, nitrogen. Sometimes there's a single n by n matrix A such that x1 is equal to A times x0. x2 equals A times x1. x3 equals A times x2 and so forth. So in general, x sub m plus 1 equals a times x sub m. And more compactly, we can write that. It's just this final equation, x sub m plus 1 is equal to a times x sub m, where m ranges from 0, 1, 2, 3, and up. This defines our linear dynamical system. Here's an example that we're going to develop in detail in this video. Suppose that a county has two regions, a higher density region called the city and a lower density region called the suburbs. Here's a picture. This circle represents the county and inside the county, say toward the center of this county, we have a higher density region called the city and surrounding the city we have the suburbs. Let C sub n represent the city population at the beginning of year n. Let S sub n be the suburb population at the beginning of year n. Labeling the diagram here, we have Cn people in the city, Sn people in the suburbs. In this example, we'll let n equals 0 mean year 2000. So for example, n equals 17 denotes year 2017. So let x sub n denote this vector c sub n, s sub n, and we call this a population vector at the beginning of year n. For example, x sub 3 is the population vector at the beginning of year 2003. It includes the city population and the suburb population. Here's some of our simplifying assumptions. There are no births or deaths in either region. Each year 95 percent of the city dwellers stay in the city and 5 percent move to the suburbs. And each year 97 percent of the suburban dwellers stay in the suburbs and 3 percent move to the city. And implied in these assumptions is that no one moves into or out of the county. So with those simplifying assumptions we can write the following schematic. The city and the suburbs 95% of the city people stay in the city each year and the 5% of them don't stay in the city move to the suburbs. 97% of the suburban dwellers stay in the suburbs and the remaining 3% move to the city. So population is just moving back and forth between the city and the suburbs this is called a transition graph. Therefore, the population vector at the beginning of year m plus 1, that's equal to the city population and the suburb population, arranged into a vector, that's equal to 
95 percent of the city population at the beginning of the year M plus 3 percent of the suburbs population at the beginning of year M and the suburban population is equal to 5 percent of the city population at the beginning of year M plus 97 percent of the suburban population at the beginning of year M. And that can be factored into this matrix times this vector, the population vector at the beginning of year M by the rules of matrix multiplication. We will refer to this matrix, this two by two matrix as M. And of course, this is the vector X sub M population vector at the beginning of year M. So this whole multiplication can be written as M times X sub M. In other words, in brief, X sub M plus one is equal to capital M times X sub M, where M ranges from zero, one, two, three, and so forth. The matrix M is called the migration matrix because it carries all information about the migration of populations between the city and the suburbs. Now that we know the matrix M, the equation at the bottom completely defines our linear dynamical system. So to be specific, suppose the initial, that is year 2000 population vector is X naught equals 500,000 people in the city and 500,000 people in the suburbs. So equal numbers in both parts of the county. The population vector at the beginning of year 2001, that is X sub one, that's equal to the migration matrix times X naught. And that equals specifically this two by two matrix times our initial population vector. Multiplying this all out, that is 0.95 times 500,000 plus 0.03 times 500,000. That gives us city population of 490,000. And 0.05 times 500,000 0.97 times 500,000 gives us a suburb population of 510,000. Note that when we add up the city and suburb population, initially it's 1 million at the beginning of year zero, and the beginning of year one, it's also 1 million. So that's consistent with our assumption that no one is moving into and out of this county. There's no births or deaths. They're just moving between the cities and suburbs. Therefore, the population is constant. So try this. What is the population of the city and suburbs, one, at the beginning of year 2002, and two, at the beginning of year 2003? Put the video on pause. We'll check answers together. So here are the solutions. At the beginning of 2002, we're interested in the population vector x sub 2, which is equal to m times x sub 1. Writing all this out, it's equal to that matrix times that vector. And multiplying out the matrix times the vector, 0 0.95 times 490,000, 0.03 times 510,000 gives us this number, 480,800. 0.05 times 490,000, 0.97 times 510,000 gives us 519,200. So the top number is the city population at the beginning of year 2002. And the bottom number, that's the suburb population at the beginning of 2002. Notice that the total population here when you add these two numbers up, you still get a million. So let's look at the beginning of 2003. 
population vector x sub 3, that's equal to m times x sub 2. And again, we just multiply out the matrix times x sub 2, as we did before. And we get this population vector, the top number being the number of people in the city at the beginning of 2003, the bottom number being the number in the suburbs at the beginning of 2003, and again, the total population, if you add up these two numbers, you get a million. In summary, here's a transition diagram, the corresponding migration matrix, the initial population vector, the population vector after one year, population vector after two years, and the population vector after three years. A natural question is, what trend do these populations follow? And just by looking at these numbers, we can see that the city population is decreasing, the suburb population is increasing with each successive year. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward to see. Only 95% of the people in the city are staying in the city, while well, 97 are staying in the suburbs. 5% are moving from the city to the suburbs, and only 3% are moving back to the city from the suburbs. Therefore, the city population is going down, the suburban population is going up. So something to note here is that eventually our population vector will have non-integer entries. For example, if we kept on computing here, x sub 4, that's equal to m times x sub 3, and you can multiply that out, and you get these fractional numbers. So when we're interpreting that population vector, we need to round those numbers to the nearest integer. And the reason is that people come in whole number quantities. You can't have, for example, half a person. However, when we're computing, we do not round. For example, to compute x sub 5, we use the exact numbers for x sub 4. If we don't use exact numbers, then x sub 5 will have error x sub 6 will have error, and so forth. And so we avoid this propagation of errors by using exact values when computing. In part two of this video, we'll consider the asymptotic behavior of linear dynamical systems. Asymptotic means long range or long term. In other words, what happens over a long period of time? The natural question is, does the state vector have a limit? Does this limit exist? In other words, does it settle down to a stable value over a long period of time? And if so, what is this limit? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. When the limiting state vector doesn't exist, for example, x sub n might just vary periodically. When it does exist, we will write x sub infinity as this limit. And there are many cases where this limiting vector does exist. So. We're going to consider our example from above, the city-suburb population vector. We'll show that there is a limiting vector, and we'll compute this limit. We are going to refer to this limiting vector as the equilibrium population vector. Equilibrium means things are steady, they've equaled out, they're no longer changing in time. First, let's graph the city population and suburb populations versus time. Cn will represent the city population, Sn the suburb population, and n time. Assume that the initial vector, the initial population vector, 600,000 in the city, 400,000 in the suburbs. We can compute the city and suburb populations in year one, year two, year three, so forth, exactly as we did above by just multiplying by the migration matrix. Here's a graph of what the city and suburb populations look like. The city population starts at 600,000 and drops to a stable value, kind of levels out at a lower stable value. The suburb population starts at 400,000, rises, and eventually levels off at an upper stable value. Here's the stable value for the city population. It's going to rest somewhat lower than 400,000. And the stable value for the suburb population is going to be something above 600,000. And again, this has just gotten by computing and then graphing year 
by year what the city and suburb populations are. Again, n is equal to the number of years past year 2000. You might notice that the city and suburb populations appear to approach their stable values exponentially. In fact, we're going to show mathematically why this is the case. In fact, there is exponential approach to equilibrium here. So the natural question is, how do we deduce this asymptotic behavior mathematically? And how do we compute the equilibrium population vector c sub infinity, s sub infinity? And the answer is that we find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the migration matrix. So here's the migration matrix. And if you know how to do this, try it on your own. Go ahead and try to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of M. If you don't know how to do this, you can watch the rest of the video or wait until you've reached that part of the class where you can actually do this and watch the rest of the video. So here's the solution. The eigenvalues of M are obtained by solving the characteristic equation. So we multiply this out, simplify, factor, in this case we can factor, otherwise we might have to use the quadratic formula, and therefore the two eigenvalues lambda is equal to 1 and 0.92. Now we have to figure out the corresponding eigenvectors. These are derived by finding a basis for each corresponding null space. In this case, we'll find a basis for a null space of m minus 1 times i corresponding to eigenvalue 1. So writing this out, we need to solve this linear system. Let's first simplify, and we'll row reduce, and finally convert back into an equation that we can solve. And this implies that x1 is equal to 3 fifths times x2. And therefore, the general eigenvector is x2 times the vector 3 fifths comma 1. x2 can be any scalar. Thus the null space of m minus 1 times i, that's equal to all vectors of the form x2 times 3 fifths comma 1, and a basis for that null space is simply the vector 3 fifths comma 1. Let's do the same for eigenvalue 0.92. Again, we have to find a basis for the null space of m minus 0.92 times i. Write down that equation. Here's the augmented matrix. Simplify it. Row reduce. And finally, write down the corresponding equation. Solve that equation. So we get x1 is equal to negative x2. In other words, the general eigenvectors of the form x2 times the vector negative 1, 1. x2 can be any scalar. And therefore, the null space is all vectors of that form. And therefore, a basis of the null space is the vector negative 1, 1. So in summary, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the migration matrix we have eigenvalue 1 and eigenvalue 0.92. And they correspond to eigenvectors v1 equal to 3 fifths comma 1 as a basis for the first null space, and v2 equal negative 1 comma 1. And those are the corresponding eigenvectors.
So note that V1 and V2 taken as a set is a basis of R2 because these are linearly independent vectors. And any two linearly independent vectors in R2 is automatically a basis. So this allows us to easily compute the sequence of population vectors x0, x1, x2, and so forth. How does this work? Well, x0 equals a linear combination of v1 and v2, the two eigenvectors of v1 and v2. x1 is equal to the migration matrix times x0. That's equal to the migration matrix times this linear combination. Distribute the migration matrix and pull the constants c1 and c2 out in front. We end up getting c1 times m times v1 plus c2 times m times v2. But m times v1 is equal to lambda 1 times v1, because v1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda 1. And similarly, with m times v2, it's equal to lambda times v2. So in all, we can write x1 is equal to lambda 1 times c1 v1 plus lambda 2 times c2 v2. Now that allows us to compute x2 by just applying the migration matrix to x1. Now substituting the expression we got above for x1. And distributing the migration matrix to each of the terms. And as we did above, using the fact that v1 and v2 are eigenvectors of m, we end up getting lambda 1 squared c1 v1 plus lambda 2 squared c2 v2. So we see a pattern developing here. In general, x sub n, that's going to be lambda 1 to the nth c1 v1 plus lambda 2 to the nth c2 v2. Lambda 1 is of course 1 and lambda 2 is 0.92. So substituting those values, using the fact that 1 to the nth is 1, we end up getting c1 v1 plus 0.92 to the nth c2 v2. Thus the equilibrium population vector, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of x sub n, that's going to be the limit of this expression we just derived. Note that 0.92 to the n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Therefore, that entire term goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So this term here is constant, c1, v1. And therefore, the equilibrium vector is just c1 times v1. But recall that v1 is just the vector 3 fifths comma 1. But what is this constant c1? So one of the assumptions is that the population of the county is constant, that a city plus suburbs has a constant population. So let's call this constant p. So we have x sub infinity, the equilibrium population vector. That's equal to 3 fifths times c1, c1. And on top, we have the limiting city population. And on the bottom, the limiting suburban population. But these have to add up to p. So p is equal to 3 fifths c1 plus c1. That's 8 fifths times c1. Therefore, c1 is equal to 5 eighths times p. Therefore, the equilibrium population vector is just going to be 3 fifths times c1 comma c1. Now we just plug in 5 eighths p for c1. We end up getting 3 fifths times 5 eighths p for the city population.
and 5 eighths p for the suburban population. And simplifying, this becomes 3 eighths times p, 5 eighths p, and thus asymptotically 3 eighths of the population will live in the city, 5 eighths of the population will live in the suburbs. Note that these fractions are independent of the initial population vector. In other words, how the initial population is distributed between the city and the suburbs. So for example, if the population, total population of the county is a million, x sub infinity is 3 eighths times a million, comma, 5 eighths times a million, and that's just equal to 375,000 for the city population, 625,000 for the suburban population. Let's check whether this is reasonable. At equilibrium, the populations in the city and suburbs should not change. This implies that our make migration matrix times the equilibrium vector should equal the equilibrium vector. So try this on your own. Verify that this is in fact the case. I'll remind you that the migration matrix is this matrix and the equilibrium vector is given by this vector. Put this on pause and we'll check answers together. So here's the solution. Let's multiply the migration matrix times the equilibrium vector. So 0 0.95 times 375,000, 0.03 times 625,000. And that just gives us 375,000. 0.05 times 375,000, 0.97 times 625,000. And that gives us our 625,000. And this verifies that the equilibrium vector doesn't change when multiplied by the migration matrix. Here's a shortcut to finding the equilibrium vector, and this method doesn't involve finding eigenvalues. Let's see infinity be the equilibrium population of the city, and S sub infinity the equilibrium population of the suburbs. And suppose that the total population is equal to P, and it says that the suburban population at equilibrium has got to be P minus the city population at equilibrium. So here's our diagram, city and suburbs. 3% of the suburban population moves to the city. 95% of the city population stays in the city. This tells us that 0.95 times the equilibrium city population plus 0.03 times the equilibrium suburban population has got to just be the city population because the city population is not changing at equilibrium but the suburban population is just equal to P minus the city population so this whole equation can be rewritten and solved in terms of C infinity and C infinity is just going to be 3 eighths times P. That means the suburban population is 1 minus or P minus the city population which is 5 eighths times P. This reproduces the fractions we found above using eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but it lacks the advantage of telling us how fast equilibrium is approached. And I also want to emphasize that this shortcut is really nice for two regions, but is more complicated for three regions and more. Let's use eigenvalues to figure out how fast equilibrium is approached. So recall that we have this formula for x sub n in terms of the eigenvectors of the migration matrix. And this eigenvalue, the second largest eigenvalue, is equal to 0.92. And 0.92 to the nth goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Therefore, this entire second term approaches 0 exponentially fast as n goes to infinity. And if we graph the magnitude of that term versus n, we'd see an exponential decay with exponential base 
Therefore, approach to equilibrium is actually exponential, dictated by the second largest eigenvalue. For example, when n is equal to 40, 0.92 to the 40th power, that's equal to 0.0356 and so forth. And that's roughly 4%. So after 40 years, this term here is only 4% of its original magnitude. And I want to emphasize that this vector here is our equilibrium vector. So in summary, x sub n approaches the equilibrium vector as the second largest eigenvalue to the nth power. This is exponential approach to equilibrium. And what this means is the smaller the second largest eigenvalue is, the closer it is to zero, the faster you approach equilibrium. This is not necessarily true for every linear dynamical system, but it is true for a large class called Markov chains. And this population example is, in fact, a Markov chain. Here's another approach to understanding asymptotic behavior. We're going to use diagonalization. So recall that M has eigenvectors, v1 and v2, with corresponding eigenvalues lambda 1 equals 1 and lambda 2 equals 0.92. By the diagonalization theorem, we can write M as p, d, p inverse. p is our change of basis matrix given by v1 and v2. Specifically, it's this matrix, and p inverse is this matrix and d is the diagonal matrix given by the eigenvalues down the main diagonal. We can write that out specifically as this matrix. So this helps us to compute x sub n, that is the nth population vector, in the following way. x sub 1 is equal to m times x naught, x2 is equal to m times x1, which is equal to m times m times x naught, which is equal to m squared times x naught. Likewise, x3 is equal to m times x2. And substituting x2 from above, we end up getting m cubed times x sub naught, and so forth. So in general, the nth population vector is equal to m to the nth times x sub naught. Using the diagonalization for m, m to the nth is easy to compute. For example, m squared is equal to p d p inverse times p d p inverse. And we can rearrange the parentheses like so. p inverse times p is equal to the identity. And so we end up getting p times d times d times p inverse, which is p d squared times p inverse. Similarly, m cubed is p d cubed times p inverse, and so forth. m to the nth is equal to p times d to the nth times p inverse. But d to the nth is easy to compute because d is diagonal. That's just equal to applying the nth power to the diagonal entries, 1 to the nth and 0.92 to the nth on the main diagonal. And so that's equal to 1, 0, 0, 0.92 to the nth. Therefore, x sub n is equal to m to the nth times x sub naught. And that's equal to p times d to the nth times p inverse times x sub naught. And that's p times the matrix we just derived times p inverse times x sub naught. And this entry, 0.92 to the nth, goes to 0 
as n goes to infinity. So this entire product approaches as n goes to infinity p times the matrix 1 0 0 0 times p inverse times x naught. In writing that out explicitly for p we have that for p inverse we have this matrix x naught is assumed to be this vector and we can multiply this whole thing out and we end up getting the population vector we derived above 375,000, 625,000. Again, we can conclude that we approach equilibrium exponentially because this matrix here approaches the final matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, exponentially as 0.92 to the nth goes to 0. In summary, we see that 3 eighths of the people live in the city at equilibrium and 5 eighths live in the suburbs. And I just want to emphasize that our final vector here on the right-hand side is x sub infinity, our equilibrium population vector.